Some babies get colic. What can you do for a baby that has colic? If the mother stops all wheat, all dairy and all refined sugar, she will find that her baby will not get colic. I was talking to my niece recently and her new little baby, she said, my baby has no colic, my baby just sleeps and eats and he's happy all day. And yet my other friend's babies, they have this crying, usually mid-afternoon to maybe eight o'clock at night. And as I talked to my niece, I realized that my niece is on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet. What shall I feed my baby? This is a dilemma because there are so many voices out there today. What is the best food for children? How should we feed the children? Well, I'm going to use the BHSC method, Bible, History, Science and Common Sense. And there's not a lot of talk in the Bible about how children were fed. But if you look traditionally at history, you'll find that Babies were not fed food for sometimes a couple of years. Babies were often breastfed for, for many years. And breast milk was the predominant milk. There are some times when a mother cannot feed a baby. And this might be because of um, stress. That's usually the main thing that will stop a mother being able to produce milk for her baby is stress. Very occasionally you might have a situation where the baby uh, has got a cleft palate or the baby has not got a proper roof of the mouth and the mother might have a particularly long nipple and that doesn't work. But those situations are quite rare. But what I want to do is I want to go way back. The best food for a baby is established before conception. So the mother and father, ideally, and that's not always possible, is to have a couple of years where they implement these eight laws or these eight principles of health so that they have a strong genetic code to give to their babies. The mother and the father must be well educated too in the functioning of the human body and also in, in how to prepare for the birth. The mother, it's very important that she be very active, that she practice squatting, that she, she know about her birth because we are, us adults, a combination of everything that's ever happened in our life. Uh, situation in utero, our birth, what happened after our birth. So it makes a lot of sense for parents to prepare, to prepare for the birth by nourishing food, by healthy lifestyle habits so that the body is working well and the body is able to go through the birth. It is true, birth is called labor. It's very, very hard work. But if the mother is fit, if she is well nourished, if she's well slept, well hydrated, she will find that she will go through her birth a lot easier. And what I say to mothers, many mothers have gone through this. And the only thing that can really make a birth a lot harder is fear. So it's very important that the mother trust her body, the trust that God made the body and birthing is a very natural experience. Squatting helps to get that whole area ready. Janet Belaskis in her book, Active Birth, she advocates squatting for 10 minutes a day all through pregnancy. So by the time you go through your birth, squatting is quite a comfortable position. It opens the pelvis, it prepares the perineum, it the cervix, everything internally in that pelvic girdle is strengthened and able to go through the birthing process a lot easier. Very important that the, that the parents or the, the couple choose attendance at their birth, that they 
are comfortable with, that are on the same page, so to speak, of wanting a natural birth. In most hospitals, it's the midwives that deliver the babies. So I think it's a good idea for a couple to get, to get familiar with, with midwives. I think to have checks, uh, what about a scan, an ultrasound in pregnancy? I choose not to. My daughters also chose not to. But one of my daughters, she was quite big. And so her midwife suggested she have a, an ultrasound. I think she was about 33 weeks. And that's when they discovered there were twins in there. Sometimes it might be necessary. I know today, sometimes every couple of months, the mother is having a scan. I always like to know when my baby's born what sex it is. I guess some couples like to know early. There's not a lot of research that's been done on the effect of that ultrasound on the baby. Um, I preferred not to use any intervention at all. When the, when the baby is born, it is important that the baby be put straight to the breast, and there's a few reasons for that. One is that the sucking reflex is strongest in the first hour of life. Also, the sucking at the nipple stimulates the uterus to start contracting so that the afterbirth can come away. Also, in that first three days, there is no milk, but there's colostrum, which is a thick, creamy substance that is essential in the building up of the baby's immune system because the baby's immune system, all our immune systems, are established basically by our gut flora. It also shows the importance of before the baby is born that the mother establish good gut flora in her gut because her gut flora, of course, influences the gut flora that she's going to give her baby. When my babies were first born, I used to feed them one breast at a time. When I fed my babies one breast at a time, it gave the other nipple a little bit of a break. I fed my babies probably about every two hours for the, for the first few weeks. About the, about the third day, the mother wakes up and her breasts are very large, an indication that her milk has come in. If her breasts are, are very painful with the swelling, she can have a hot shower where she massages the breast area, always finish with the cold. She can also put bruised cabbage leaves on. With the, with the cabbage leaf, you just bruise it a little bit or hold it in half a little bit and that, it's a lovely size to go over the breast. A lot of ladies put those cabbage leaves inside their bra Important to have a bra that is made out of natural fiber. If the nipples get a little tender, and the nipples will always be a little bit tender, which is why I used to feed my babies every, um, every two hours, but I would feed them one breast at a time. And I found that the breasts adjust quite nicely to that. When the milk fast comes in, you might like to release both breasts. And sometimes a lady will have a shower while she will express a little bit of milk in the shower just to pay, take a little bit of relief off her breast. If you empty too much, it gives the message for the breast to keep making that much milk. Mm. When the baby feeds, it's important that the baby face the breast. Some babies are bound up and their head comes to the side when they feed. If their head comes to the side, it puts a dragging effect on the nipple. But if the baby is facing the nipple, it doesn't drag the nipple. So if a mother is feeding her baby on the right side, then the baby's left arm can go under the mother's, behind the mother's back, and that will ensure that the baby is facing the breast as the baby feeds. And that can make a big difference to the nipple because, again, the nipples can be quite tender at first. But I would encourage mothers, they will be tender at first, but they, they will ease. <laughs> Be careful of any creams that you put on the nipple. It's probably best just to put a little coconut oil on the, on the nipple. A little bit of oil can help because whatever you put on the nipple, the baby, of course, is going to get a little bit when they start to, start to suck. The best milk for baby is breast milk. What if the mother cannot feed? What if she is unable to feed? 
I know in the US you have La Ligue League, which is an organization that helps mothers to be able to breastfeed. So I say to a mother, please, before you make a decision, go and investigate, get help. But it's very simple with breast milk. The more that nipple is stimulated, the more milk will be made in the, in the nipples. I was probably about three months of age. Maybe I, my baby started to feed three hourly. I also found that at the end of the day, the baby is a little bit more demanding. Some babies get colic. What can you do for a baby that has colic? If the mother stops all wheat, all dairy and all refined sugar, she will find that her baby will not get colic. I was talking to my niece recently and her new little baby, she said, my baby has no colic, my baby just sleeps and eats and he's happy all day. And yet my other friends' babies, they have this crying, usually mid-afternoon to maybe eight o'clock at night. And as I talked to my niece, I realized that my niece is on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet because she used to get quite bad eczema. I said, that's why your baby has no colic. <laughs> it's because of the food you're eating. If a mother does not want to stop her dairy and her wheat, then I guess she has to either consider her crying baby or consider putting the baby on another form of milk. I have met many mothers who had babies with eczema, psoriasis. They stopped the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. Sometimes it takes about two months and then the eczema, the psoriasis clears from the baby. One mother sent a picture of her baby after a month. She said, I have stopped the wheat, I have stopped the dairy and yet the baby still has eczema. I said, be patient. It only takes 24 hours for a slice of bread the to be out of your body, but the effect can remain. The effect can remain for sometimes two months. At exactly two months, she sent me a photograph of her baby, no eczema. <laughs> sometimes it can be a mold if the baby has contact with mold. One lady told me that she, her baby was restless in sleep. The baby had asthma. She was trying all sorts of things. And then she pulled the cot out one day and down behind there was black mold. So that baby was breathing in that black mold. So it, it can also be exposure to mold. It's very important to make sure the baby dresses in natural fiber. You can get organic cotton. If you can't get organic cotton, please wash the cotton baby clothes you get and put them on the clothesline. The sun will purify and it will purify those clothes because cotton is one of the most sprayed crops I know in Australia. So it's important to wash these beforehand. What about, you call it diapers, in Australia we call them nappies. A lot of mothers are going back to, to nappies and they're buying these, these little pilchers, I think they're called. So they look like this and They've got, a, they've got a little insert where they can put a little cloth pad in here. And so all they have to do is wash that cloth pad and there are little studs here. When I was a mother, we bought a, a cloth like that. We folded it over and so that we made, we made it like this. And so the baby basically was like that and this would be pulled up and then that was pinned. So it's a lot easier today. So we had to wash those great big cloths, but today you can get cloth nappies that are a lot easier to use. You can also get diapers, we'll call it diapers. You can get diapers or nappies, disposable ones that have been made out of starch. So when they're made out of starch, you know they don't have the bleach chemicals in them. My, my daughter was using them and if she visited, and she changed her baby's diaper, she could just put it in my fireplace or she just put it in my compost bin because it's, it's biodegradable. So if you do wear disposables or do use disposables, I should say, for your baby, try and get the biodegradable ones. They might cost a little bit more money, but my daughter said that she found that they lasted a little bit longer. She didn't have to change her baby as often. 
These are things to consider looking at your, your little baby. So with the clothes, the baby could wear cotton or silk or bamboo or hemp. There are some natural fibres that are made out of wood pulp. One is Modell, the other is um, viscose and also rayon. These are made out of natural fibres. So many mothers are told today they must sleep their baby on, an, on, on the back. My daughter's a cranial sacral therapist and she's finding many babies whose skulls aren't developing properly because they have to lay them on their back. One lady told me that you can even get a tie to put on the baby to make the baby stay on its back. I always put my baby on the stomach. You see, they're in the womb all curled up, so they like being curled up. I always put my baby on the stomach or on the side. And all my daughters did exactly the same thing. And then that head, it formed so beautifully. Breastfeeding is very important for the formation of the jaw, for the formation of the roof, roof of the mouth and even the, the skull. Because when a baby sucks with the breast, it's hard work and their little jaw is going hard. It's not near as hard work with the bottle. So breast milk and breastfeeding, not only is breast milk perfectly designed for that baby, but the breastfeeding is important for the proper development of the jaw, for the, 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 the teeth that are going to come through, for the roof of the mouth and even for the skull. So getting to three months and the baby now is starting to be a little bit more alert, we're getting to four months and the baby usually starts rolling. So it's a great idea to have the baby on the floor. When the baby just stays in those little capsules and many, many parents just keep their baby in the capsule, it's not very good for their back. Obviously, they've got to be in the capsule to go somewhere. But when you get wherever you're going, please take the baby out and lay it on the flat. When you lay the baby on the flat, it is much better for their spine and the development of their spine. And when they're flat on the ground, then they can start to roll. It's important to allow baby to have its milestones to develop at every stage. Often by four to six months, mothers are told to start feeding their baby food. But it is not a good idea. Teeth usually appear around seven months of age. Sometimes it's a little earlier, sometimes it's a little late. The first teeth that appear, so let's draw this up. So the first teeth that appear, first teeth are the milk teeth. That's what they've traditionally been called is milk teeth. And milk teeth is, is comprised of the top four and the bottom four. And these are the front teeth. That's at the front. So these are milk teeth. And the reason they're called milk teeth is because that's what babies should be having, milk. It's also taste time. Taste time is giving them a little bit of something to taste, a little bit of food. But I never did that until the baby could sit. So this is about seven and a half months. My baby could sit about seven, seven and a half months. By then they certainly are putting things into their mouth. And my baby's first teeth came in around seven, seven and a half months. So when you're sitting at the table, they're very social beings, they like to be there with you, put on their little high chair a piece of cucumber or put on their high chair a piece of apple or a piece of net, um, net bag. You can buy these net bags in the pharmacy or in the, even in the supermarket and you can put a piece of apple in there and they can suck away on that and that prevents any... Uh, any lumps say, going down their throat. Because when they don't have a lot of teeth, they're, they're using more sucking. So I would give my babies little bits to chew on while we ate our meal. By the end of the meal, um, they're, they're still going. It takes them a long time. If you take all the corn off a cob of corn, that keeps them happy for a long time. It's a really nice size and they suck away on it. So it's taste time. It's taste time, and this is happening around, this could happen anywhere between seven to say, 
maybe 12 months, the milk teeth are coming through. Some babies are very interested in food. Some babies are just not. If they're not interested in food, it doesn't matter because their main nourishment is coming from milk. What if the baby can't breastfeed? What would be the best milk? I've had some mothers say to me that you can get nut milk formulas. I do know in Australia you can get goat's milk formulas. And the baby goat is a lot closer in size to the baby human than the baby calf. Cow's milk is not the best milk for babies. Cow's milk causes a calf to grow bodily a lot in that first year, but not a lot of brain growth. So it's not the best milk for babies. And I found almost without exception, every baby that has asthma or eczema, it's a cow's milk allergy. I've even spoken to pediatricians and they've told me that if a mother has a baby with eczema or asthma and the baby's on cow's milk formula, they get the mother to go over to the goat's milk formula. And if the mother is breastfeeding, the doctor gets the mother to stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. Not every pediatrician says so, but I'm glad to know that there are some pediatricians that acknowledge this. Because if you give a baby drugs, if you give them the cortisone cream at a young age, it can interfere with the development of their glandular system, their brain system. So ideally, if at all possible, it's best not to do that. What did I used to do when my babies were teething? What did I give them? I really didn't give them anything. <laughs> except for maybe a cob of corn to, with the corn off it to chew on. They like, they like working their gums. A uh, piece of cucumber is also really good. Piece of celery, that's also good. They gum away on that. Did I give them anything? No, I didn't. But what I did do, if they were a little bit upset, maybe for a few days, I would just carry them in the sling a little bit more. And I found that when they were past teething, then they'd happily go and play on the, on the floor again. So I raised six babies, but I did not give them any drugs at all. Panadol is not a safe drug for baby. I guess that's the, that's the drug that we give in Australia. It's called baby Panadol. But all drugs have side effects. Drugs are made out of chemicals, and they do affect the kidneys and the liver. So I chose not to give my babies, anything like that. So the first foods should be just pieces of fruits, pieces of vegetables, and I only used to give them at meal times. Sometimes a really hard prune, they might suck away on that for, for quite a while. But when the baby's molars came through, so the molars, they come through probably, it differs. 14 to 20, sometimes 22 months of age, the molars come through. So the molars, when they come through, they're the grinders, then the salivary amylase is released. And the salivary amylase is called tylen. And tylen is the enzyme that breaks down starch. So no baby should receive any starch until the molars are fully through. So what's starch? That would be breads, that would be biscuits, cakes, cookies, cereals. Let me give you a story to illustrate. I had a lady contact me and her baby was 10 months of age and she said, my baby was a preemie baby. My baby was two months preemie. So my baby is smaller and a little slower than others and they will be. But she said, my baby has, my little baby has this swollen stomach. I said, really, are you breastfeeding? Yes. Have you stopped the wheat and the dairy? She said, yes, I have. I said, is the baby eating food? Oh, she said, yes. I said, what are you feeding your baby? She said, cereal with some toast at breakfast. And she said, at lunchtime, he has sandwiches. And in the evening, maybe some vegetables, maybe a little bit of pasta. I said, how many teeth does your baby have? Oh, six, she said. I said, are you aware that it is not until the molars are through that the salivary amylase is released 
and then Tylen breaks down the starch. She said, I did not know that. Many mothers do not know that. I said, I believe the swelling in your baby's stomach is because your baby's eating a food that he can't digest properly. She said, but he's used to eating. What will I do? I said, breastfeed him before he has his meal and for breakfast, give him fruits. And then at lunchtime, vegetables. Sweet potato baked is a good one, whereas the white potato is a bit starchy. But with the sweet potato, the baking of the sweet potato, it turns all the starches down to simple sugars. And bananas, bananas are great for babies. She said it took the little one a few days to get used to the different food. But she said after three days, his stomach went right back to normal. She said, thank you so much. I had, I had no idea about the, the molars, the salivary amylase and the tylen. Let's fast forward now. The little one is 14 months of age. This mother contacts me again. She said, Barbara, my little one, he was starting to crawl. He stopped crawling. He's preemie, remember? He'll be a bit late. And he won't eat any food now. All he wants is breast milk. So I began to investigate. I said, is he teething? She said, yes. <laughs> she said, the molars are starting to come through. Oh, that's good, I said. But she said, um, what, what if he gets brain damage? I said, why would he get brain damage? She said, well, he's only having the breast milk. I said, did you know that hundreds of years ago, sometimes babies didn't eat any food till they were two or three? My son James was 16 months of age before he ate food. He just was not interested. My son James is a musician. He plays the panpipes. He's 43 now. He's a master builder. He's built like a bodybuilder, so he didn't seem to lack. <laughs> she said, oh. She said, what if his muscles start to deteriorate? I said, I don't think that will happen. I was intrigued as to why this mother was thinking these things. And then I received an email from her father. He said, I'm a scientist at a university. He said, we're very concerned about our grandson. We believe that if he doesn't start eating food soon, he's gonna get brain damage. And my wife is a physiotherapist and because he stopped crawling, we think his muscles will deteriorate. And then I realized where this mother is getting these messages from. We think he should go to the hospital and be tested to check that he's getting enough nutrients from the breast milk. I said, really? I said, so what would these tests entail? I know what they entail. They would take blood tests, which would further distress that baby. No one, especially little ones, likes needles going into them. And would he be so distressed that that would even turn him off the breast milk that at least he's getting? And I said to this man, did you know that several hundred years ago, babies didn't feed food? They didn't eat food sometimes till they were two or three. That means Einstein, Galileo, Rembrandt, Bach, Handel, the geniuses, the masters. It didn't seem to hurt their brains that they weren't receiving food till later. I said, the baby's teething. When the teeth come through, the baby will start crawling again and the baby will start eating food again. He is getting breast milk and that breast milk is perfect. The milk in the breast is perfect for the one month old. It is perfect for the six month old. It is perfect for the nine month old. It is perfect for the one year old. No other milk will do that. I didn't hear anything back. I heard from this mother a month later. She said, thank you so much. He's crawling now. His molars are through. He's eating again. Thank you so much. I got an email from her father. He said, thank you. Can I give you a donation? I said, if you so choose. I got $400 in my account. <laughs> they were very relieved because I know that when you go to that hospital, and the test now, if a, if a baby is sick and you're wondering what's happening, of course take him to the doctor. Of course have him checked out. But I knew that this baby was just teething. And when they're teething, 
They want mum more. They want to feed more, which is good. They're getting lots of milk. And when the teeth are through, they'll resume back to their daily pastimes. We've got to be careful we don't let fear influence our decisions. In my last lecture, I talked about the front part of the brain, the reason, intellect and judgment. That's where we make our decisions. God says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love and of a sound mind. And so when the molars come through, the baby can start eating the food like the rest of the family. My last baby, I breastfed until he was three. I think William's 33 now. Some of my babies were more interested in food than others, but I always let the teeth guide me. Let the teeth guide you. What would you feed a two-year-old? What would you feed a three, four, five-year-old? I never made special food. They just ate with the rest of the family. And I always steamed a bit of broccoli or steamed a bit of cauliflower or steamed a bit of carrot. Then the little one sees the colour and taste the flavour and they get to know their vegetables. So what would a breakfast be? Let's have a look at a breakfast. This is the breakfast that I feed my grandchildren. It is the same breakfast that the whole family eats. Fruit. Fruit is a great starter in the morning. And you can set the little one up at the table, or the little ones if you've got a few, and they can start eating their fruit. And that gives mother a little bit of time to get the rest of the breakfast ready. And then they can have a grain. And the grain might be oats. The grain might be millet. If a baby has eczema, if a little one is prone to eczema and has a gluten intolerance, they're best to go lightly on the oats. Yes, it is a different gluten that is in wheat, but it has a, a different structure, but I find that they still may be sensitive to that. Quinoa, quinoa makes a nice breakfast. Rice, rice makes a nice breakfast. So you could have a little bit of all of that. The Polish and the Russians love their buckwheat. You can make nice buckwheat pancakes. So that might be your grain is buckwheat pancakes. So you can make a few things out of these grains. And then you might use coconut, coconut milk, or you might use uh, an organic soy milk, or you might use almond, it's whatever, whatever you like and what goes well. And then children love sprinkles, so you can sprinkle ground linseed or you call it flaxseed. So ground flaxseed, then they're getting a nice amount of the omega-3s, omega-6s and omega-9s. Ground flax, also chia seeds. So that is a wholesome breakfast and what you'll find is you will not have to feed them again <laughs> for four or five hours when they have a breakfast like that. Or another breakfast could be always starting with fruit. We always started with fruit. And then it may be a sourdough toast. And I'm going to give you a website of beautiful sourdough toast or beautiful sourdough bread. It's www.simpleneeds. This is a family business and they are masters in the sourdough.com. And they have a lot of gluten-free. They have kamut, which is the ancient grains, they have some lovely ancient grains. And then you might have on that toast avocado. And on that you might have scrambled tofu. My, my grandsons love this breakfast. So you might have scrambled tofu or savoury lentils. And then you might have a few nuts. Both of these breakfasts are high in fibre. They've got generous proteins and healthy fats. So what I've given you there is probably a different breakfast for every day of the week. If you do a different grain every day and sometimes do the toast and the, 
and the more savoury type of breakfast. What about for lunch? It's a good idea to give lunch as the main meal. I have a photograph of my little boy James in his pyjamas with his head on the table with his dinner next to him. <laughs> and that's what really influenced me to start giving the children the main meal at lunchtime. So what can we do for lunch? I always started the children with a salad. Just like the fruit at breakfast time, start them with a salad. Because if you put the salad and the baked potatoes and the, the lentil burgers on the table, they're, they're going to bypass the salad and they're going to want to go to the burgers, they're going to the lentil dal, the baked potatoes. So I always put the salad on the table first. And they love dipping. Have a hummus dip or an avocado dip. And, and they love dipping bits of carrot, bits of cucumber, bits of celery. So that can, that you can start them with that and that gives the mother a little bit more time in the kitchen to put the final touches on the last few things. She might bring the potatoes out and say, oh, they're a little hot, oh, the lentils are a little bit hot or the kidney beans are a little hot. So some sort of protein, it's nearly ready, just eat your salad. That's a good way to encourage them to eat the salad. And then vegetables, it might be baked or steamed or stir fried and then your protein. So the protein can be some form of bean, say legumes. So we have so many different legumes. It's nice to have a variety. So the legumes can be lentils or lima beans or black eyed beans or might be a soybean a, and a tofu. Organic tofu is fine as long as it is organic. Might be uh, black turtle beans. So have a variety of the different beans. Also tofu, I guess that's also a legume. Also, you can make some nice uh, burgers and things out of ground, ground nuts. So ground, I think we're here yesterday we had some burgers that were made out of uh, ground walnuts and maybe some oats or millet, something like that with onion. Lots of, lots of great recipes, nuts and seeds. We have one that our guests love and it's... Uh, Lightly roasted sunflower seeds, slightly ground up, mixed with tofu and breadcrumbs and onion, and they're, they're made into like um, burgers. And a nice dessert is even a few cashews. That can be very nice. I used to make my children dessert maybe twice a week because children love sweet things. And when they'd finished their main meal, eaten all their salad veggies, then, then they could have the dessert. There, in fact, I mentioned earlier in the week, you can get some really nice recipes for raw cheesecakes made out of the coconut, coconut oils with uh, ground nuts and maybe a tin of pineapples in that. Just um, Google that. <laughs> That's what we do today is Google. Also little balls and the little balls can be made out of ground nuts and seeds and a little bit of coconut oil to bind it together and put in the freezer. So there's quite a few thick desserts that you can make for children. So what about if they're at school? What can you do for lunch if they're at school? A great lunch that a lot of uh, people that have been to our program are starting to do with their children is they'll do a hummus or an avocado dip and some just raw veggies because I think we know children don't eat very much at lunch at school. You can also put those little ground uh, nuts and seed and dry, dried fruits balls into their lunch box. Rice wraps, getting the rice paper, softening the rice paper, and there's all sorts of things you can put in there. You can even make those rice wraps the day before. It's a great alternative to children who are gluten intolerant. It's like, like a little roll that they'll, they'll eat at lunchtime. When my daughter had her children off all all grain to conquer their eczema. She sent them to school with big slabs of baked sweet potato and they'd pick that up and, <laughs> and eat that. Also in the Simple Needs, that's their delicious breads. There's also gluten-free crackers that, that they can take. A lot of mothers with children at school have told me that they serve the main meal when the children come home from school because they're always hungry when they come home from school. So that's another thing that you can do. 
you serve them their main meal then. Well, what about father? He doesn't come home for another two hours. Usually when father comes home, he's tired and he's very happy to just eat quietly by himself. And maybe the mother can sit and sip on a peppermint tea or have a bowl of soup with him. So there's a whole lot of um, things that you can do. Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And the meals that I've given you are all high in fibre. They are all, they all contain generous amounts of protein. And they all contain the healthy fats. These are the three essential nutrients. And the last one is uh, healthy fats. What if your child is used to living on pasta and bread? <laughs> what do you do then? Well, you get the pasta and bread out of the house and little by little, you introduce the other foods. It's good to start with what they like. You can get pulse pasta today, which is pasta made out of legumes. So that's a great way to introduce them there. You can get brown rice pasta. I always mix the pasta with the sauce and then served it because children that are used to living on bread and pasta and cereal, they, they don't even want the sauce. Now the first meal, the child may not eat a lot. And if the child put on a turn at the table because they're not happy because they haven't got what they usually have, the best thing is to quickly put them outside or quickly put them in their bedroom, but get them away from the table. And if you have not fed them since breakfast, you'll know that they're hungry. The best thing to give children between meals is water. What about if they're two? Well, I was still breastfeeding then. And if you give the breakfast that I showed you, I find that the children easy go. I often mind my little grandchildren and I find it too, they can easily go. I think parents realize that when children say they're starving, uh, they're not. They're often thirsty. And if they say they don't want water, you can say, well, sweetheart, you won't be able to have lunch until you've drank your water. So always be kind to them. It's also important for the parents to establish authority <laughs> because these children need guidance. Always guide them gently. Always guide them firmly. Always have the rules there. Don't talk too much. It exhausts them. Just say, I love you very much, sweetheart. This is what's happening. And if you break the rules, well, this will have to happen. But if you abide by the rules, then then there's the reward. So make it very simple. If you need a little bit more help in this area, there's an excellent book called Have a New Kid by Friday. It's by Keith Lehman. And at the end of every chapter, there are testimonies from parents who had a new kid by Friday. Basically, it's just a book on cause and effect. So it's very difficult if there's not been any guidelines or rules in the home to suddenly implement this. But remember, Rome wasn't built in a day, little by little by little, especially when the parents have a united front. Very important for the parents to make their decisions in the back room and then come out as a united front. A child hasn't got a hope <laughs> when you've got an, an united front. Always be tender, always be courteous to your, to your children. Never let them answer you back always insist that they be courteous. And if they're not courteous, well, they can go and sit on a stool in the corner for a little while, or they can go out the back for a little while. Teach the child from cause to effect. And remember the, the title of the book, You'll Have a New Kid by Friday. It sounds that simple. That, that, that author also sells another book, Have a New Teenager by Friday. Another one, have a new husband by Friday. One lady was reading the book and halfway through the book, she threw the book down and she said, this is a stupid book. All it's doing is talking about me. That's right. So in the changing of the children's behavior, in the changing of the teenagers, the husbands or the wives, or it's all about changing the way we react. It's all about changing the way that we, we guide our children through life. 
So it's of the utmost importance that the parents implement these eight laws. They go to bed early. It's of the utmost importance that every morning, and I did this every single morning, I prayed. I said, Father in heaven, give me wisdom for each of these children today. I prayed for them by name and God will give you wisdom. But if you've had a late night, if you had a large meal before you went to bed, if your bedroom's got technology all the way through it, then it's going to be very difficult to have the control that is necessary not to lose it when the children are frustrating. And sometimes they are. So it's very important that the parents start with their own lives. It's a wonderful thing, raising children. It's a high calling. And it is not impossible to raise them so that when they leave your home, you've just sent to the world a human being that is responsible, that is honest and will be a blessing wherever they go. That is a high honour and through God and through God alone it is possible. So parents, I trust you've been encouraged by the things that you have learnt through this presentation. It will not be easy, but remember, practice makes perfect. And parents, if you, if you present a united front, then you will be able to bring up your children to be honourable, to be honest, and to be a blessing to the world.